The First Civilization by Jas Garka. Copyright Copyright 2012 Jas Plites. Garka. This work may be duplicated and distributed for educational and informational purposes only. Any unauthorized distribution for commercial purposes or monetary gain is in violation of the copyright. Correspondence email address, thefirstcivilization at gmail.com. Prologue Unva Change Things by Fighting the Existing Reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. R. Ah. Buckminster Fuller is a certain model that pervades virtually every aspect of our lives. It affects the way humans behave and interact with each other, determines which humans wear diamonds on their fingers and which ones dig for diamonds in the dirt, and even plays a strong hand in determining who lives and who dies. The model I speak of is human society. Our political, economic, and social systems combine to create a very peculiar model for our global society. In our current model, it's possible for one continent to face an obesity epidemic while another continent faces mass starvation. Resources that could be used to improve human lives and alleviate suffering are instead turned into weapons with which to end human lives and encourage suffering. A highly adaptable and intelligent species, capable of mastering complex technologies and surviving in virtually any environment, has become its own greatest threat to survival. Our global society seems to be a fantastic model for inefficiency, needless destruction, and the complete absence of logic and reason. In keeping with the advice of Mr. Fuller, the purpose of this book is to display to the world a new potential model for human society. In this new model, we take full advantage of our scientific and technical prowess to free humans from mundane labor tasks and create an abundance of goods and services. We rid ourselves of obsolete constructs such as money, national borders, governments, and all other forms of oppressive control. This is a system that recognizes the inescapable interconnection of every organism on the planet, and sees that the suffering of one human invariably leads to the suffering of other humans, and the deterioration of society as a whole. And finally, this is a system in which actions are determined not by the amount of shiny coins that must be arbitrarily traded for their completion, but by the availability of the Earth's resources. This model is called a resource-based economy, RBE. And RBE is a system unlike any socio-economic system that has been employed in history, in that it was not designed by consulting traditional beliefs or ancient philosophies. Instead, this model was conceived by using the most powerful tool in the history of human thought, science. In this system, we attempt to address the problems facing society by considering evidence and making choices based on logic and scientifically supported ideas. Using scientific thought, we can treat society's problems as technical issues, to be solved the same way that we troubleshoot a malfunctioning computer, or attempt to repair a car. If an idea conflicts with the evidence, it must be re-evaluated and revised to be in better accord with reality. Unfortunately, contemporary society has, in a depressingly large number of ways, completely separated itself from reality. So, as you read this book, you will almost certainly come across claims and theories that seem to spit in the face of common sense, but which are actually backed up by our scientific understanding. Not surprisingly, we'll start things off with a quick science lesson. This book begins with an introductory chapter on human behavior, and the way the environment in which we live and grow has a profound effect on our development. It is of critical importance that we understand this concept before. It is of critical RBE, since many of the ideas we'll encounter on our journey seem counterintuitive and contrary to common experience. Having an understanding of the link between our behavior and the environment will therefore prevent a lot of, of unnecessary confusion. One could easily write an entire book on this subject, but for our purposes, I will simply highlight a few examples and behaviors that are particularly important to address. Once we are equipped with this basic knowledge, we'll head into the main body of this book. At this point, you'll also understand why I have chosen the title The First Civilization. Section 1 is a thorough, 
in-depth look at a potential configuration for a resource-based economy. We'll discuss the specific technologies that could be used to make such a system possible and how they would be utilized for our benefit. We'll also talk about the ins and outs of managing a system without money, governments or any other form of coercive control. The main point of this section is to provide you with a solid understanding of how this kind of system might work. That being said, you'll probably find yourself with more questions than answers. This is where section 2 comes in. In this section, we will go over questions, concerns, objections and complaints that have been brought up in response to the B idea. Specifically, we'll go over such issues as how to deal with unlimited human wants, fears of a new world order, the economic calculation problem, issues relating to artificial intelligence, comparisons to socialism, overpopulation, and many others. By doing so, we'll further see the logical strength of this theoretical system. Of course, we must keep in mind at all times that this system is, as of right now, still entirely theoretical. No matter how much evidence and logic we have in favor of this idea, it ultimately does us little good unless the idea can be thoroughly tested, and its merits can be observed and measured. Enter Section 3. Here, we will go through an example of a step-by-step -step protocol that could be used to test an RBE. In keeping with our general theme of scientific thought, this plan takes the form of a series of scientific experiments. In addition to providing us with a way to test the B concept, it would also serve as a very interesting experiment in human behavior and health, we could learn just how much of a negative impact our current system is having on the physical and mental health of our species. The primary purpose of this plan is to create an example community that is based upon the principles of an RBE, and use this as a platform to push for further, ideally, global, implementation of this new system. As you read this book, keep in mind that my purpose is not to create an absolute, immutable instruction manual for this system, or to make any absolute claims about what the future should look like. Rather, I simply wish to provide one possible example of what the future could look like. My goal is to show that a system as seemingly fantastic and idealistic as an RBE is not only technically possible, but is fully within our grasp to create and would have a high probability of success. In addition, I fully expect that every specific idea I put forth in this book will eventually be superseded by better ideas and superior technologies. In fact, I sincerely hope that this will occur. The quality that truly separates science from all other methods of thought is that science accepts nothing as an absolute truth. Ideas continually evolve and improve, so you should expect that even as you are reading this book, many of the specific technologies I mention will have already been rendered obsolete. But worry not, for the specifics are not nearly as critical to the success of our species as the general understandings we will gain from this thought experiment. One final point I will mention before we begin our trip is this, question every word that I say in this book. After all, I'm literally just some random guy, and there's absolutely no reason you have to believe a single thing that I say. For that reason, I've filled this book with references to other works by experts in their fields, and I've applied my own logic and reasoning to the ideas and concepts in these works, in order to give you a comprehensive argument for an RBE. I would encourage you to employ your own sense of logic as you read on, to ensure sure that the evidence I offer and the logic I use is actually sound. I didn't write this book to give you answers, but to give you new questions to contemplate. Let's begin, shall we? Table of Contents Prologue Introduction Section 1, How to Make a Civilization Section 2, Questions? Concerns? Section 3, This is the Test Epilogue Citations by Section Introduction In our tenure of this planet, we have accumulated dangerous evolutionary baggage, propensities for aggression and ritual, submission to leaders, hostility to outsiders, all of which puts our survival in some doubt. We have also acquired compassion for others, love for our children, a desire to learn from history and experience, and a great, soaring, passionate intelligence, 
the clear tells for our continued survival and prosperity. Carl Sagan Human Behavior and the Environment If we were to walk out into the wilderness and observe the behavior of wild animals, what would we see? In all likelihood, we would witness brutal competition and intense violence. This is because animals live in an environment of scarcity. They are forced to compete and fight with each other because there are simply not enough resources for everyone. Instead, resources go to whichever organisms are the most well adapted to obtaining them. This is the basis for evolution by natural selection, as first postulated by Charles Darwin. This is also the reason that life in the wild is so harsh, unless an organism is willing to fight for its life, it will probably end up losing it. Given this reality, it's not surprising that so many people believe that these same traits define human behavior. We observe the violent savagery of animals in the wild, and we simply assume that this is exactly how humans would behave if there were no societal pressures forcing us to work and live together. But is this assumption actually true? In order to find out, we'll need to explore some basic principles of genetics. And, like many things in science, it all starts with an equation. Before we dive into it, let's define the terms that make up this equation. Genotype, this is the word that describes the specific set of genes that you have inherited from your parents, which make up your unique DNA. In other words, your genotype is like a blueprint or set of instructions that describes how to construct a you. Phenotype, this is a description of the physical traits and behaviors that you currently display. In essence, this term describes you as the unique organism that you are, whereas as genotype refers specifically to your unique set of DNA. Obviously, there is some link between the two terms. That link is the third and final term in our equation. Environment. This is, to put it bluntly, everything that is not you, but which might have an effect on you. This includes the type of climate you live in, the food you eat, the job you work at, the people you spend time with, the television shows you watch, the amount of sunlight you get, your physical activity levels, and so on. But how does the environment relate to the first two terms? Well, it goes a little something like this. Genotype plus environment equals phenotype. What exactly does this equation mean? In short, you are born with a huge number of genes, most of which contribute to your survival in certain situations. However, some genes are more useful in certain situations than others. For example, the genes involved in growing your hands when you are a fetus are not very useful when you are an adult. This is where environment comes into the equation. Your body constantly senses the information coming in from the environment. This, in turn, causes changes within the cells that make up your body. These changes actually signal certain genes to turn on, and other genes to turn off. This is why genotype and phenotype are not identical, just because you have the genes for a certain trait, there is no guarantee that trait will manifest if the environment does not encourage it. Another way to think about it is to imagine that your DNA is like a menu at a restaurant. Each item on the menu is like one of your genes, and the environment is like a person choosing their meal. Depending on what is preferred, some items will be ordered, and others will not. The meal that is created in the end is like your phenotype. The important thing to remember is this, your genes alone do not define who you are or how you will turn out. Our genes interact with the environment in order to determine our phenotype. This means that all of the things I listed above, where you live, the people you are surrounded by, the quality of your diet, this book that you are reading, have the very real ability to affect the expression of your genes, which ones will be turned on, and which will be turned off, and they are doing so right now. This relationship between genes and the environment has been given the extraordinarily creative title of Gene Environment Interactions is abbreviated as GXE. But how does GXE relate to human behavior? The genes involved in our behavior are much like any other genes, depending on the environment present, certain genes will be expressed while others will not, which can cause notable changes in an individual's behavior. For example, 
A study examining a specific gene involved in aggression and violent behavior showed that a certain environmental trigger was required for this gene to have any noticeable effect on behavioral phenotype. Individuals who inherited this gene did not display any more violent or aggressive behavior than the general population under normal circumstances. However, those who were subject to abuse as children were significantly more likely to be aggressive and display violent behavior, regardless of whether or not they inherited this gene. In that case, those who did have the gene showed the highest levels of violence and aggression. So what do we learn from the above case? As it turned out, the idea that humans are naturally violent and aggressive could be considered true, in that we are all born with the capacity for violence. However, this capacity does not simply manifest itself for no reason, regardless of an individual's genetic makeup. Instead, violent behavior seems to be a response to a violent environment. The individuals who possess this specific gene can be thought of as being particularly well adapted to a violent environment but this clearly does not result in violence unless there is a sufficiently traumatizing environmental trigger, in this case, child abuse. Therefore, it is reasonable to assume that if one were to exist in an environment that was completely non-violent, where traumatizing experiences like child abuse would not occur, we should see little, if not zero, violent behavior of any kind, regardless of what a particular human is genetically programmed for. Unfortunately, the effects of a traumatizing environment don't end with violence and aggression. Another study by this group involved a gene associated with depression, and yielded similar results. Possession of the gene alone had little effect on an individual's susceptibility to depression. However, those people who had experienced a sufficient number of very stressful life events were much more likely to experience depression or to have suicidal thoughts with more stressful events correlating with greater likelihood of depression. Once again, this effect occurred regardless of one's genotype, but those possessing the gene had a higher chance of falling prey to the environmental influence than those who did not, showing the greatest probability of experiencing depression and thoughts of suicide as a result of stressful life experiences. My point in bringing up these examples is that we should not be so eager blame individuals or human nature for the variety of violent behaviors and mental illnesses, such as depression, which are so prevalent in our society. Unless we are willing to closely examine the environmental conditions in which these types of behaviors develop, we cannot honestly say that we understand them. Of course, you might think that I am simply absolving individuals of their responsibility and attempting to blame society for the choices people make. After all, aren't the choices that we make as individuals important? Of course they are, particularly as our choices are incredibly effective at shaping our environments. However, we need to keep in mind that our choices are ultimately a product of or, and often, limited by, that very same environment. For example, if a family lives in an impoverished village in a developing country, where they are simply unable to generate enough income to provide basic necessities for themselves, what options remain? Essentially, their choices are limited to starvation and subsequent death, or stealing food from someone else. Should we be surprised to see such high crime rates in areas afflicted with poverty and unemployment? Almost certainly not. Let's apply this same logic to developed countries. How can children avoid a life of violence and crime when they are constantly exposed to gang violence? How can we expect an impoverished youth to avoid criminal activity, when a child grows up see being all of their wealth and affluence in the hands of criminals, while their law-abiding parents struggle to provide them with even the basic necessities of life? Once again, there are a variety of choices that could potentially be made but those choices involving violence and crime seem to be the most highly rewarded. Therefore, if we plan on creating a society free of violence and crime, it would of the utmost importance to ensure that we create a system in which violence and crime are not actively rewarded behaviors, as they are today. We need to remember that the single most important factor in determining evolutionary success is adaptability. 
our species has risen to dominance on this planet because we are the best at adapting to whatever situation is presented to us. Give us an environment in which violence is prevalent and crime pays, and our species will do what it does best, adapt to the environment, and display whichever behaviors will encourage our survival. So, we now know that the behaviors we often think of as being criminal are due in large part to the existence of environments in which these behaviors are actively encouraged to flourish. However, there are still other non-criminal behaviors that require addressing. Perhaps one of the most important of these is laziness. We have a tendency to think that without the motivating factor of money, which forces us to work in order to, to survive, that people would naturally become extremely lazy and unproductive. But is this assertion actually true? As it turns out, much of the evidence seems to suggest the opposite, that the primary cause of laziness is the fact that we are forced to work. There are specific types of jobs that actually encourage people to be lazy. An individual working at a job in which they have little control over their actions, a job in which activities are passive and require little mental activity, or a job which causes a high amount of mental strain, are all causes of laziness. This somewhat surprising link has two major explanations, one is that long-term stress, which is closely linked to one's job cause an organism to reduce its activity levels and become lazier. The other reason refers specifically to the case of passive and low control jobs. A job in which there is little physical and mental activity causes the individual to adopt a similar type of lifestyle outside of work. Laziness is prevalent because of the stress we experience from our jobs, and the general lack of fulfilling activity that is inherent in some types of jobs. On the other hand, activities and occupations that require creativity, and which encourage physical and mental activity without being overly stressful seem to have no link to laziness. It turns out that not only do many jobs actively encourage laziness, but that money itself is only a motivating factor for these kinds of jobs. Money will have positive effects on work and productivity if the action being performed requires no creative thinking or very little mental effort. However, if the activity being performed involves creativity and self-expression, then money has virtually no motivating effect whatsoever. Instead, the act of creation itself is the motivation. People genuinely enjoy exercising their creativity and mastering complex skills, and seem to require no outside influence in order to do so. This is a particularly important point to remember. Money is only a motivating factor for mindless and uncreative activities, and these types of jobs are also the major cause of laziness. Of course, one other reason people so often stress the importance of work is because one must always remain competitive. We live in a global competition-based society, where everyone is constantly forced to compete with everyone else for jobs, money, and various intangibles such as social status. I wonder how this might affect our behavior? In order to understand, we first need to understand a bit more about what makes us act competitively, and just as important, what makes us sometimes behave in the opposite manner, and act cooperatively. So, why do humans act competitively? As I've already mentioned, competition is the basis for evolution by natural selection. Therefore, it is no stretch to assume that humans have evolved with a capacity for competitive behavior. However, our species often exhibits another type of behavior, cooperation. Humans may not be the only species to act cooperatively and exhibit altruism, but the level of cooperation has risen to truly amazing levels in our species. But if evolution is driven by competition, where did these cooperative behaviors come from? After all, an act of altruism means that an organism voluntarily reduces its own fitness while simultaneously improving the survivability of a potential competitor. Did we, in fact, evolve to be cooperative? Is cooperation a cultural construct? As you might expect, the real answer is a little bit of both. There are several theories that attempt to explain how cooperative behaviors might have evolved in Earth's animals. The theory of reciprocal altruism suggests that an organism will go out of its way to aid another member of its group, 
even if this act might compromise the survivability of the helpful organism. This is done with the expectation that the favor will eventually be returned, thus both organisms will eventually benefit from the relationship. The theory of kin selection states that we have evolved a drive to give help to our direct and extended families, those organisms whose genes are the most similar to ours. This is done in order to ensure that our general set of genes are passed on, even if it is a family member who actually survives to do the passing, rather than us. Handicap theory suggests that altruism and cooperation are just more additions to the long list of behaviors developed in order to make us appear more attractive to the opposite sex. In the same way that a healthy male peacock is able to squander valuable nutrients on its elaborate tail, thus displaying how wealthy the peacock is in nutrients, so too might a human go out of their way to assist someone, simply to show that they are successful enough to do so. Essentially, an organism will handicap itself in some way in order to show how sexually desirable it is. It's likely that the evolution of cooperation was due to a combination of these mechanisms. Each theory has some evidence in its favor, but none of them alone are sufficient enough to completely explain the extreme collaborative behaviors found in human society. It's more likely that the type of collaboration seen in our species are due not only to an evolutionary drive to cooperate, but also from cultural need. For the vast, vast majority of human history, we did not have the complex, competition-based societies we see today. Instead, humans were organized into small hunter-gatherer tribes, who survived by moving from place to place, foraging for food and occasionally hunting. In such an organizational structure, it would be critical for the members of a group to be able to cooperate with each other in order to ensure the survival of the tribe. Cooperation within the tribe would also have been necessary to defend against occasional inter-group violence, where a tribe might be forced into direct, and bloody, competition with other tribes. As we might expect. There is evidence to suggest that periods of inter-tribal violence were highest during times when resources were scarce, thus increasingly forcing tribes to compete with each other. In such situations, cooperation within the group would have been vital to ensure the survival of both the individual organism, and the group as a whole. Those groups who lacked the ability to cooperate amongst themselves would have been much less likely to survive. We can clearly see that there are both evolutionary and cultural pressures that shape our competitive and cooperative behaviors. This is further demonstrated by studies that examine the relationships between competition, cooperation, and the society we live in. It has been shown that the tendency of a human to behave competitively or cooperatively actually varies depending on the type of economic situation at hand. In a competitive economic system, Competition and selfishness tend to be the dominant behaviors, in the cooperative system, cooperation and fairness tend to be more dominant. Likewise, studies have shown that children associate greater self-esteem with whichever type of behavior is the dominant one in their culture. They associate competition with greater self-esteem in competitive societies, and they associate cooperation with greater self-esteem in cooperative societies. Just as with other kinds of behaviors, one could say that humans are naturally competitive, as well as being naturally cooperative, in that we are born with the capacity for either type of behavior. Once again, we humans demonstrate our powerful adaptive abilities by displaying whichever behavior is required for our survival. It is also interesting to note that cooperation is generally a far more productive type of behavior than competition as cooperation tends to result in tasks being completed with significantly higher quality, as well as inspiring greater innovation and creativity. Alternatively, competitive opponents have a tendency to waste a large amount of potential progress on attempting to thwart each other, with less progress being made on either side than if they had cooperated. There is, however, one aspect in which competition tends to outshine cooperation, and that is speed. When groups are in competition with each other, tasks tend to be performed much quicker than if they had cooperated. In short, if you want a job done quickly, you should encourage competition. If you want a job done well, you should encourage cooperation.
I'll take this time to point out the fact that one of the main arguments in favor of competitive systems like capitalism, is that competition supposedly results in greater innovation and productivity, which is, in reality, the exact opposite of what research shows. Just thought I'd mention that. I should also mention that one of the major effects of living in a competitive environment is long-term stress. There is evidence that the stress caused by our constant need to keep up in a competitive society can wreak absolute havoc on our health. This is because stress results in the elevation of the hormone cortisol. Long-term elevation of cortisol is associated with increased blood sugar, insulin resistance, loss of muscle mass, loss of bone density, increased abdominal fat storage, decreased immune function and a whole host of other delightfully debilitating effects. This phenomenon can clearly be seen in people who work at jobs which involve, surprise, surprise, low perceived control, or with little opportunity for the mastery of skills. These individuals not only have constantly elevated cortisol compared to those working jobs they actually enjoy, but they also have much slower clearance of excess cortisol from their bloodstream following a stressful event. Unfortunately, this means that if you have a job you hate, it's not just ruining your day, it's actually directly killing you, and from multiple angles. If that's not bad enough, there is also the effect that stress has on infants. We have to keep in mind that the environment is not just what we experience after we are born, the information a fetus receives from its mother forms an incredibly crucial aspect of that individual's environment. A chronically stressed out pregnant mother will actually give birth to a child that is tuned to a high stress environment. These children will have elevated levels of cortisol for their entire lives. Unfortunately, in order to remain financially competitive in our society, pregnant mothers will often continue working well into their pregnancy, which increases the likelihood that this kind of event will occur. Of course. A competitive environment does not just cripple our children before they are born, but continues to do so right through their childhood and into their adult years. Evaluation systems that are based on competition and hierarchies, such as the almost universal policy of assigning grades in education systems around the world, have been shown to actively discourage kids from learning. Instead of inspiring students to work towards achieving their highest potential, they are instead compelled to do the minimum amount of work required to avoid failure. In summary, a competitive environment will encourage competitive behavior, which results in less productivity, higher stress, and a tendency to exert the least amount of effort possible to avoid losing or failing. And now, we go full circle back to the first point I mentioned. In nature, competition is everywhere. Animals must constantly compete with each other for scarce resources and mates. In modern society, this has clearly not changed. Humans must constantly compete with each other for scarce money and social status. Despite having dressed it up with dollar signs and advertisements, today's society is virtually identical in principle to the animal world. Our socio-economic system emulates the harsh scarcity of nature which forces us to express primitive behaviors such as competitiveness and violence in order to survive, exactly as it would be if we were still living in the wild. In what sense, then, have we actually created a real civilization? We've certainly created societies, but then, so have chimpanzees. To actually call what we have now a civilization is, in my opinion, extremely short-sighted and completely illogical. Instead, I think it is more accurate to say that all of recorded human history thus far has actually been an intermediate phase, representing a major revolutionary transition. This transition is transforming us from the primitive hunter-gatherer species we've been for the vast majority of our time on Earth, into the first truly intelligent civilization to exist on this planet. As my writing this, it is the year 2012 CE and it seems that we might be nearing the end of this transition. We are now poised to create a society in which the harsh scarcity of nature no longer rules our lives, a society in which primitive notions of violence and competition will become the exception rather than the rule. And most importantly, 
we can finally create a society in which the needs of every human are met, and all people are able to live in freedom and exercise their creativity. We are now finally able to create something that can truly be called a civilization. The next step in human evolution is about to begin. What an interesting time to be alive.